So today I'm going to talk about uh, setting controls for the Heart of the Sun, customizing WordPress for big media. I won't read my slides line for line, I promise. Um, so about me, I'm Daniel Westall. I'm a WordPress developer at HumanMade. So what is the Sun? The Sun's one of the UK's largest publications by readership. Um, you can think of them as a UK version of I'm not going to try and pronounce that. But they're very similar in audience they focus for and content they produce. So this is the typical homepage for the Sun. Very recent development. Now, the Sun are owned by a company called News Corp. Who's heard of News Corp here? Oh, that's good. So in case you haven't, News Corp is one of the, one of the world's biggest uh, media publications. They own properties like the Wall Street Journal and of course the Sun and many other many other uh, properties. So why would a company like News Corp be interested in WordPress using that as a platform? WordPress is a mature platform. Who here has seen a talk by John Blackburn regarding mature WordPress? Okay, quite a few of you haven't. I recommend you go see that watch that talk. I'm going to include a link in my slides and they'll be posted after the presentation. It's a great talk and it goes into quite a bit of detail about why WordPress is now can be considered a mature platform and where it will go from here. So in choosing WordPress to be their platform for some of their biggest publications, they've set out a set of goals. Now, if you're a, mu a media organization like them, one of those goals is to get news out fast. And for that, you need a great editorial experience. They need to be able to present the content quickly. They need to be able to present it how they feel their readership will best digest it. So looking at past iterations of their own CMS, they came up with a list of problems. Now, these were the three main ones. A publishing delay. If you're breaking news, no one wants to wait 15 minutes for the news to be shown on a website, not from an editor going, we're going to publish this story, and then we're going to wait for the viewership to get in and read it. 15 minutes is unacceptable in today's world where they're competing with Twitter and other platforms that are close to instantaneous. New features were hard to develop. They had a monolithic Java, Java system, and that had some time delay for new features. If they wanted a new feature to experiment with their readership, that was very hard to develop in a timely manner. Something that they could measure. It created long tails. By the time they'd thought about the feature and actually developed it, time had moved on. It was no longer relevant. And the last one, but probably the biggest, is an unfriendly editing UI. Who here? Uses, well, I imagine everybody uses WordPress admin. We all take it for granted that WordPress's admin user interface is amazing. We've all used custom CMSs, we've all tried other alternative CMSs, but the UI that WordPress has for admin is probably industry leading at this point, from accessibility down to iconography and meta panels, it's flexible. So with that, and several other problems, well, they come up with seven big requirements. The first problem being no abstraction. So what do I mean about no abstraction? No text boxes. They don't want to be removed from the content they're editing. They don't want to put in a bit of text and then somewhere, somewhere else, it appears. Every step you take, you remove an editorial person from that content, it loses some focus. So with this, we come up with a solution, Customizer. Now, Customizer has been in WordPress since 3.7. It's a very different experience. It happens on the live site. You can give a preview. And this is the best way, with no abstraction, to show what the editors are doing. So this is what the site looks like in Customizer. We have a selection of articles that reporters have input, and then we have the actual page itself with its current layout, 
current news articles and whichever they've focused on. And then they can move forward and edit this. Second requirement, they need to see what the public sees. How often has anybody heard, well, it works fine on my machine? That was one of their pet peeves. We didn't want to build a separate rendering solution. We had, the theme, we had a theme, we should use it. It's a single point of contact for the customizer to use. There's no separate rendering engine. We are using what the user sees. And that was very important for the editorial. So when this project was first envisioned, the new theme for the sun, as I showed earlier, was already 90% complete. Now, you don't just go away throwing 90% complete themes, especially for a site as large as the sun away. It just wouldn't make any sense. So we had to come up with a solution that enabled us to work with the theme in a, in a way that we didn't have to rewrite it. We didn't have to switch to moustache or any other dual rendering template system. So solution for that was Ajax for template parts. Now, the theme was already broken up very well. Everything was contextual in the templates parts folder, all the teasers. So leveraging that allows us, or allows an editor to edit the page. So they can bring in some content, create a new block, so here, we select the article they want, place it in a block. Now that does an Ajax callback, fetches a renders a template, and fetches it back and replaces on the page. And from that mechanism, we haven't had to rewrite the theme. We don't need to write a, a dual rendering template system. It just works. Requirement four, edit content without meta boxes. Now, this sounds very similar to no abstraction, but by default behavior in Customizer is to give you a text box, you enter some text, and in the preview window it changes. This is, again, too much abstraction for them. They wanted to actually edit the content. They, their design was very in integrated into editorial. They wanted the text returns to be perfect, and for that you need to see where your text ends. And the best way to do that is to render in inline content, and then edit it inline as well. So an editor can take their article, edit it, and then change the headline as they see fit. Now, this is all done with HTML5 um, content flags, and it allows them. We're not doing very complex editing. It's nothing like a WYSIWYG. We're just editing in a single line. We haven't got to write paragraphs or formatting. Um, that would be a much more complex solution. But for a simple line of text, you can edit it with the HTML5, click off, and that text is now done. And then they save the page. Requirement five, notification of updates to admin UI. So the Sun has a very particular flow. They have an editorial that will sit in the customizer, pr predominantly for the whole day or their shift. And as new stories come in, they are giving, they add those stories to a page. And then depending on what type of message they want to craft, they change that. The teaser headlines, they can change the images. Now, when an when a editor does that, that change has to be reflected back to the admin UI. Because more often than not, especially with breaking stories, the content is being edited simultaneously. You have the editor placing it on page, and you have the reporter continually updating it. So we need to let the reporter know that their editor has made headline changes and whether they want to accept it. So how do you fix that problem? Heartbeat API. Who here has worked with the Heartbeat API before? Who here loves the documentation? Yeah. Um, yeah. So using the Heartbeat API, we piggyback off the post lock-in mechanism. So an editor will go in, update the title. Once he's finished updating it, save the page. We then flag the content with editorial locks. And in using the API, we let the reporter know that some, whoever's made the change, and then they can accept that change and that will be presented in the meta boxes. This stops race conditions and overwriting of data that the admin editor may have changed. And this was 
one of the biggest requirements. Um, when you're editing stuff in a customizer, the changes are saved back to the, the, the post, or the article in this case. So we need to make a, a way of reflecting those changes. Requirement six, add new parts to the page. So the Sun deals with a very large page. It's about 80 articles last time I counted. Um, and as new content comes in, they need to be able to add blocks, add articles. They have rails, which are another concept. So I'm going to walk you through how we break these down, um, what they look like, and then how the editor can go about adding these contents and increasing the size of the page. So a block contains articles, and each article has a certain number of sizes. So here we have highlighted of a small teaser. We have a block, which obviously contains those teasers. And then Rails sits somewhere outside this. They are a separate entity, uh, usually automatically generated from a taxonomy. And they're just a collection of interesting stories. I mean, for this one, I believe it's Chelsea, uh, Chelsea stories. And then the editor can add these to a page. So we add a new block. We select the format. They have multiple formats. And then they select what articles they would like to place in that block. And using that tool, they've created a full content block. Now, at this point, they want to create a rail to go underneath. So we add a new block. We change that block to a rail type. And then we have multiple different types of rails. So in this case, we're going to select Chelsea. And we're going to drop that into the block. Now, you may have noticed blocks are not actually rendered in Customizer. That's because they're not changeable by the editorial team. Not yet. At this point, refresh the page, and we have our content block, and we have our rail. Requirement number seven, need a workspace with persistence. Now, if you're dealing with seven, well, more than seven, if you're dealing with 80 articles, if you're dealing with 80 articles, hold on, there we go. If you're dealing with 80 articles, you need a place to work with the articles. You're going to get multiple stories throughout the day. You need to be able to move the page around, give it some breathing space, give yourself some workroom. Because if you've got 80 slots and they're all filled, you need a way to do it. So we come up with three solutions for reflowing a page. Clipboard, Cascade, and Teaser States. So we're going to talk you through that. So if an editor goes to make changes to an article, in the headline, and then moves it to clipboard. They don't want to lose those changes. They're dealing with hundreds of articles a day. It needs to stay. So it goes into clipboard. They keep the changes. They can add a new block to give them some room, and then move that teaser into that block. And as we can see here, the changes will have been kept. Now, if they're not happy with that flow, they can then move it again with a tool called Cascade, which is basically a permanent replace. So you, you, you place one, you pick up one. You place one, you pick up one. And then they've reflowed the page. And then once not, if not happy that block, they get the option to delete it. So how does all this tie together under the hood? We have a DOM layer. And we make changes to that DOM layer, very simply. If we have a, a new teaser, we place a new teaser into the DOM. At that point, events are triggered. And we go through the DOM, read the order as the DOM is presented. And from that, generate a JSON blob. Now, that JSON blob is very descriptive. It contains stuff like divs, their classes, what's within columns, their objects that are in columns, whether it's a teaser, a rail, or other. And with that, we can build the page. And we save that via customizer, save settings, down to the database. Now, who's heard of the acronym CRUD as developers? Oh, OK. So not everybody. So that's your standard CRUD is create, read, update, and delete. Now, everybody does that. You do it in the admin UI. When you create a post, you rip the a person on the front side can read it, or the person that's created it. He can then delete it, and he can also update it. It's a very standard for pretty much every web app. With the sun, we skew this somewhat. We get rid of update and delete. 
So as changes are made to a page, we create a new JSON blob. We then save that back down. We never ever do try to, cr try to change the JSON blob itself. We just manipulate the DOM, create a JSON blob to record that, save it down. Once we come up with a new, a new layout, we new JSON blob, saved. We never tried doing a diff on the JSON. One, there's a few reasons. One, this was deemed the simplest one, because we're not dealing with a JavaScript rendering engine. Um, and two, time frame. The whole site, plus editorial layout editor tools, was done within six months. So not having to do an update and the diffs and necessary complication that brings, um, transversal, up swapping, very much quicker a very much quicker method. And delete. We never delete layouts. We just literally update the value. So wrapping up, this is just one of the many tools that big media demand. They need flexible ways of presenting their, presenting their content. That is the one key that you can take away from this. They will need individuality. They're not happy with an archive page that automatically generates anymore. They want to be able to edit that story and make it suitable for their readership. So that's it for this one. Questions? Great. Thank you, Daniel. How about a big round of applause to start with? <laughs> Do you have any questions from the audience? Here's one. Do we have a runner? Hi, thank you for the talk. Very interesting stuff. Uh, can we hope to get any of that stuff that you did there at open source? Uh, um, <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> Thanks. I'm wondering, how do you handle media? Media? So an editor can change the images. If we go back to have a So these images that they're presented with, they're all uploaded. They have different sizes, um, but they can change those. If we go back a bit further. So in here, we have the different content types on this side. Um, we have the articles as they come in, images, the clipboard. Now, with images, they can actually replace those on the fly. Um, they select an image, they drop it onto a teaser, and that teaser accepts that image, and that's changed. Um, it depends on sizes. It's persistent based on its size it takes. So if I change the, the tool image, the portrait, and then move it into a landscape image, it won't, it won't take that change with it. It remembers it if you do move it back to that type of slot, but the image is um, dependent on slot, and they can change that as well. How do you manage? I mean, there must be thousands and thousands and thousands of images. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you manage that? And uh, how do you go about with like duplicates and, uh, and, so and just the sheer amount of it? Yeah. They have, um, so they have a particular workflow with images with some custom functionality. They need, images need to be credited. Um, who here has worked at? Someplace, name no names, that will just pull a Google image off Google, hope its, cop hope its copyright license is correct, and post that on an article. Hands up. I think, okay, a few. Um, but somewhere like the Sun, they need to, images need to be credited, they need to be licensed, and they need a way of tracking this. So traditionally, what happens is the image desk will come up with an image, and then that will be uploaded to the admin on that article. So when it's uploaded, it takes some metadata out of that image and it puts it into the meta for that attachment. And that way, they have a way of referencing what's been used. Um, in terms of scalability, they have a, a fair size image, but um, duplicates sometimes happen. It's a complicated workflow when it comes to images. So sometimes they can be destructive, but not normally. OK. We have any more question from the audience? Um, so how do you go about when, when you, if there's multiple editors 
changing this. Uh, does stuff break, or is that the thing that you're doing with the Heartbeat API? So the changes that an editor makes are reflected back to the admin user interface. But in, we've extended custom, we've extended, when you, two people try to edit a post, you get a lock-in screen. Uh, we've extended that mechanism to customizer. So two editorials can't be on the same page, changing a layout, a lock will kick in, and it will notify the person who else is on this page. Um, and they can also boot that user out and say, like, I'll take over this page, goodbye. Um, they get the option for that as well. What was the hardest thing about this project? Probably the meta API. So if when an uh, editorial makes changes in line, reflecting that back to the admin UI has, can have some unintended side effects um, because you, you're no longer dealing with your standard flow. It can become bi-directional. Um, so there can be some unforeseen circumstances, and it requires a lot of testing to get it through. A well-defined scope as well can help tremendously when dealing with that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>